This podcast contains adult content suitable for mature audiences only. Listener discretion is advised. Out of the darkness and into the fire. Welcome, my dear travelers, to the morbid forest. We're almost there. The end is just ahead, my dearest traveler. And this is where we part ways, for your path is not my own, and it is your destiny you must face. But don't you fret, I'll give you a parting gift, a token of sorts, a token to pass unbidden. For while I cannot choose your direction, I can guard you from the spirits that lie ahead. Let the evil you hear and the evil you see bind itself from causing you harm. Do not invite the spirits in. Keep yourself safe, my dearest traveler, as you traverse these desert nights. I was five years old when I first met him. He stood at the end of our gravel driveway, sitting back on his heels as I sat on the bumper of my father's Oldsmobile. My fingers were wedged tightly in my ear canals, fruitlessly attempting to block all sound. I hardly noticed his arrival. My parents were fighting, an act so expected in my world it was almost terrifying when the fighting stopped. I would bet money that they were fighting, even the day I was born, my wails no match for theirs. His hair is burned bright into my mind, orange like glowing campfire embers, sat atop his triangle head with a long nose, the tip as dewy as a spring morning. His eyes gave me pause, even at that age I knew they weren't natural, yet They were utterly beautiful. They blazed iridescent in the night. They were not the usual shade of mud puddle brown you'd expect a fox to have. I can't tell you why or how I knew it was a he, but I knew. We sat in perfect silence together, my fingers uncorked from my ears, the sound of my parents' fight only a whisper. I could have stayed and stared at him all night, but eventually he rose to leave. My tiny heart lurched, my stubby fingers twitching to lace themselves in his fur. I felt my body rise from the bumper, my legs all too willing to follow. But back then, something still held me back. Or preferably, a someone. He stood a moment longer, lingering deciding whether or not to urge me into following him. Instead, 
he gave me a single fanged grin and bounded into the night. And I bounded after him, but just within the confines of my dreams. When I woke, it felt as though I left something behind. My heart burned red hot within my chest as the remnants of the dream faded into the morning light. A dream followed by countless others, filled with unknown adventures, just my fox and I. It was another three years before my dream fox came physically calling once again. My parents were fighting yet again. I don't even know what started it, but in all honesty, it never took much. You could look at Pop wrong, and he would strike you faster than a rattlesnake. You learn to keep your head low and never covet anything in plain sight. A beer bottle chased us out the front door, glass crashing under our feet, slicing angry strips into the pads. I hoisted Tommy, my favorite little someone, by the waist, trying to save him from the brunt of it. He screamed in protest, but I ignored him. Don't throw bottles at the kids. My mother's hoarse cries whipped through the night. The reply was the distinct echo of palm on cheek. I flinched on reflex, my small hands pushing my brother under the Oldsmobile. I slid in next to him, dust pluming over our faces. Tommy vibrated violently next to me. I needed a distraction. Let's play a game, hmm? I looked at my brother, his face streaming with tears. It was unfair that he didn't know how Pop operated yet. He was only five. He would understand in time. For now, I was here to guide him through this. What else were big sisters for? I drew a circle in the dirt and tapped his shoulder to scoot back further under the car. He followed as he always did. I snagged a few pebbles as I went. Once we were a reasonable distance, I placed a stone in his tiny hand and raised another in between us, eye to eye. Let's see who can make it in the circle or the closest. For every stone you get in the center, you get a point. Tommy's eyes were already alight, his face streaked with dirty lines from his dried tears, but... At least they were dry. We played our circle game to the soundtrack of thrown objects, curses, and other not-so-pleasant notes. The song continued through several rounds of our game, lulling us into an uncomfortable sleep beneath our rusted chariot. I'm not sure what woke me, but when my eyelids finally fluttered open, I was greeted with a sight of dirt and the undercarriage of the car. A quick glance to my right confirmed Tommy sleeping soundly. So peaceful and happy looking. A state of being I wish I could provide him at all times. As quietly as I could, I slid from the safety of the Oldsmobile. The night was quiet, signaling finality of the earlier fight in its usual manner, a booze-induced coma. I dusted myself off, checking once more that Tommy was safely fast asleep. Rising, I made a mental note to start looking for new places of refuge. In a year or two, I wouldn't fit under our metal protector anymore. But that could wait. The real question was, what woke me? I rounded the old car, facing the mouth of the gravel trail that led to our trailer, Our incredibly sad trailer park home sat near the border of the Navajo Reservation, just outside Segi, fenced by blunted stalagmite mountains, the same color as Danae's skin, and with only cacti to call neighbor, we were as isolated from our people as could be. Way out here, away from the other members of our tribe, it felt like we were a demented nation of our own making. We rarely went to ceremonies or communed with our other tribe members. The only other people we saw regularly were Nane, my father's mother, 
and the sleazy customers of my father's bootleg business. The former more out of convenience than family ties, as Nene's trailer lay in perfect proximity to the casino. Pop and Mom could be found amongst the cigarette haze every Saturday, making it the only true routine Tommy and I had. Still, it was nice to have someone to be tied to, aside from Tommy. The silver glow of the moon licked across the desert, swiping through the canyon landing softly on luscious orange fur. I wanted to rub my eyes and make sure I wasn't still dreaming under the Oldsmobile, afraid he would disappear from the sheer closing and opening of my lids. I didn't want this to be yet another dream. We stood a few solid drum beats, each watching the other. My heart beat singing through my chest. I tried to collect myself, no, to dare myself to do what I had been dreaming of for so many nights. I inhaled sharply and dared to move. The sound of my shoe crunching gravel was deafening against the sky. My eyes locked fast to his. My advance pulled slowly in like a lazy tide towards the moon. Slowly, inch by inch, I felt unworthy of him, a bronze fox god sent to the plains just for me. A stoic yet whimsical expression played across his smoldering eyes. Nearly there, my arm rose like a zombie, fingers splayed, yearning to bury themselves deep within a sea of silk, his black button nose tilted up, ready to engage. Kai. We both froze, centimeters apart. Kai. This time, my knave held a hint of panic. I sighed, turning to see Tommy trying to wiggle out from under the car. I looked back hoping to plead with my fox to stay, just wait a moment, but he was already gone. The sandy pedestal he sat upon, now dimmed to ash, as if the moon was saddened by his departure. I sighed once more and went to retrieve Tommy, simultaneously sending silent prayers. My fox will not wait as long to return to me. How long does destiny keep a person waiting? Too long, if you had asked me then. Ten years. Ten years too long anticipating... What, exactly? Destiny was one event, but what about the events to follow it? There are nights I lay with my back in the sand, and my face tilted toward the stars, pondering over my particular after destiny events. A naivete from my early days, hanging on to the possibility of some egregious misstep. Some point in time I could have stopped and said, fuck destiny. However, in the end, it is just a way to pass the time. As pointless as it may be, my destiny had ensnared me within its treacherous weeds using those irresistible iridescent orbs of light to lure me in like an angular fish. Hey, dreamer. My Nene's voice broke my thousand-yard stare, bringing me back to the present. Hmm? Where's your head, girl? Nene came to stand next to me at my easel. My brush sat idly in between my index and middle finger, waiting patiently for its next stroke. The eyes weren't quite right. Nene humped. <laughs> Still painting foxes, I see. I just can't get it... Uh, right, I said half to myself and half to her. I must have painted him countless times over the last ten years, but each one was missing that particular something in the eyes. 
My memory scanned through every chocolatey moon-filled image saved. Their ethereal pull called to me from within my memories, and I sighed in outward frustration. Oh, come sit with me a moment. Maybe it'll come to you if you take a step away. Nene's stiff hands gently guided me away from my fox to her old stuffed couch. I plopped down eagerly, letting the fabric swallow me slightly. Everything in Nene's house was old like her, but somehow every inch of it was infused with her grandmotherly touch, it giving you no choice but to be comforted. Nene ambled to sit across from me, her old bones clicking over crackling leather, as she eased into her easy boy chair. We didn't say anything for a moment. Nene said thoughts were like arrows. Once released, they strike their mark, but guard them well, or one day you may be your own victim. Maybe my arrows had yet to find its mark. Nene breached through my thoughts, her voice distant. What do you know of the fox or his brother the coyote? I let her read the confusion on my brows. What do you mean? A fox is a fox, none, hey? What more is there to know? The words left me on their own accord. My skin bristled as I flat out lied to Nene. I didn't hide anything from Nene, but my lips remained mute. Guilt played fiddle in my stomach as I tried to keep my face neutral. The fox was for me, and me alone. Not in every case, Kai. Nene paused, words failing her, on where to begin. I waited, eyes darting nervously between my grandmother and the fox on the canvas. When she spoke, her voice held all the command of her age. The fox is cunning and swift. He can guide you through your life. And that is if the fox is just a fox. But what if he is not just a fox? I didn't know what she meant. But I had a feeling she was talking about something of our people. Unexpected anger bubbled to the surface. <laughs> Nene, I'm not a little kid anymore, and... No, you are not, she interrupted sharply. But you are still naive like one. I said nothing in return, my tongue remaining taut, waiting for the opportunity to strike in protest. I wasn't a child anymore she could scare with Danae's ghost stories. When she spoke again, her voice vibrated with something I never knew my grandmother to possess. Fear. Ye not Lushi. The name glided like a ghoul through the room echoing against the thin walls of the trailer. I shivered, the name foreign to my brain, but my body, rendered with the spirit of the Dene, appeared to know the name. Nene flashed to her feet, nearly causing me to yelp in surprise. She was at my side in two short strides, knobby knuckles forming a vice over my petite fingers. Her eyes blazed with a warning as fierce as the noon sun. I fear even saying its name will conjure the demon, but you must know. Curse your father for passing his exile to you and your brother. Curse him for his clouded ignorance. That boy has caused me more trouble than he is worth. Whatever you do, Kai, if this fox is indeed the beast I believe him to be, you must forget him. Leave it well enough alone. What? I wanted to scream at her. That was impossible. The fox was mine and I was his. I knew it in my bones. I also knew the fears of our people bound her, whatever they may be. I opened my mouth to say as much, but Nane barreled onward. You don't know enough to know the dangers lurking in our desert, but trust your Nani when I say you must let this go. These, these creatures. <laughs> she spat on the carpet as if the simple descriptor were the dirt on her tongue. They are the creators of evil as we know it, Kai. They fester in their iniquity. 
their magics are powerless in the light. Evil? I shot to my feet, anger permeating through my every muscle. Nani, you are being ridiculous. Animals aren't evil. You are letting your outdated, superstitious ways get the best of you. I was practically shouting by the time I was finished, my chest heaving frantic scores of outrage. Rebuffing Nani's pleas to stay and listen to her lore nonsense, I charged past her. The trailer's feeble screen door, no match for my rage, smashing with a bomb-worthy boom into the other wall. Spearheading forward, my bike was under my feet, dust flying in my wake as I strove to place distance between us. But I could not outrun her cries as I absconded from view. Beware the ye not Lucy! Beware the skinwalker! Don't let it in! Kai! Kai! The ride home was more than a blur. My eyes felt dehydrated from crying. My body ached in every aspect. Allowing my bike to crash into the dirt, I was relieved to discover the trailer was devoid of life. Tommy chose to accompany our parents to the casino. We both learned to drive by the time we were 12, and although he was 15 and didn't have a license, he was still the perfect designated driver to cart my parents to and from the casino. I closed my eyes and inhaled, ingesting the desert air as if it were the last sustenance on earth. Evil. Opaline amber spheres ignited behind my eyelids, calming the turbulent storm raging through me. How could anything so beautiful be the founder of evil? I needed a shower. Maybe then I could unravel the truth behind my visitor. But I didn't get far. I <gasps> screamed in surprise. The fox poised in my path. It was the closest he had ever been. Only two small steps separated the space between us. Did I somehow summon him here to me in my time of distress? <laughs> I must be going crazy, I said, more to myself than him. The fox jerked his head sharply. A definitive no. A yelped tumbling over my fallen bike, landing with a hard thud and a cry on the ground. I scrambled back. The gears grated my flesh as I moved, but I hardly noticed. The fox followed, his tiny paws padding so light over the sand as to leave no trace of his existence. My back slammed to a stop against our mail post, halting my trajectory. This can't be real. You can't be real. I must be going crazy. I pulled my knees to my chest, a weak attempt to protect myself from a clear fabrication. Had I... had I always been this delusional? How could a fox understand me? In response, the fox sat on his hunches and sneezed, his head cocking to the side, as if questioning my line of questions. We sat in silence, gazing at the other through the void. Finally... I exhaled, grounding myself with resolve. I had to know whether he was real. Tentatively, I reached out at a snail's pace for him. For a moment, the pads of my fingertips hovered above his slick onyx nose. After a pause, our eyes locked and unblinking, his head tipped up, allowing his wet nose to greet my fingers for the first time. Heat kindled under the tips, bellowing a path down to my wrist and beyond, peeling my lips open in an unceremonial pop of awe. All this time, I had wondered if I had truly fabricated the being before me. Even now, it was hard to accept the current reality. I dared myself to go further than I had when I was a child to answer the pulsating call of this creature. Mechanically, I drew closer, both hands combing his silky tresses. Pop brought home jackrabbits and other game from time to time, forcing Tommy and I to skin and clean them for food and pelt sale. 
Their fur was always coarse, like old carpet with an undercoat of ash and a bleached tawny top from the desert sunlight. Traces of their languished sandstone valley life varnished their skin to a dull shine. My fox's fur held no such aversions. A fragment of my mind whispered, this creature did not belong. But I was far too deep in his coca-dusted gaze to listen. Without warning, my fox pulled from my grasp. I nearly shouted in protest only to pause when I noticed he was merely sitting back to look me full in the face. Fifteen years is a long time to finally meet. Wouldn't you agree? The desert wind howled in reply while my mouth hung agape. Not a twitch came from my fox's whiskers. But his voice echoed through the night. I was officially crazy. Or at minimum, finally having a mental breakdown. I laughed, because what else were you supposed to do? I laughed until tears sprung from my eyes and my side ached. But the fox did not laugh. He simply stared patiently, placating my insanity. Once my fit subsided, I directed my attention to him to answer his question. (laughs) Yes, I suppose it is a long time. It is also a long time to commit to psychosis, but what can you do? (laughs) I laughed again, the act stale. The fox scoffed. You think me to be a figure of your imagination, an entity built to merely cope with your abusive and unfit parents? I wanted to flinch at his observation, but instead I shrugged. If the anomaly fits. The fox's chest rumbled, chest hair waving back and forth like a wheat field on fire. I think it was that moment I began to understand that What was before me was a very real being. My grandmother's warnings tickled my mind, but I swatted it away, just an unwanted fly. How? I asked. Come, walk with me, and I'll explain. With that, he rose, trotting purposely into the desert. I should have hesitated. My Dene instincts awakening to escort me to safety of my family's trailer. However, there was no such stirring other than the one lassoed around my heart, pulling me further into the great desert. Possibly, if my father and mother had invested more into Tommy and myself instead of the wallet of the gaming reservation, I would have heard such an instinct. Perhaps if my father was not shunned for his bootlegging and ill-tempered mannerisms, we would know of our people and not be preyed upon like the gruff pack outliers we were. Perhaps none of it actually mattered. Perhaps destiny pushed me towards this life no matter the sins of the father. I assume you have many questions. The fox called over his shoulder as I trailed behind him. Yes, but I'm afraid they are all jumbled at the moment and probably won't make any sense. He chortled his high, keen noise that pricked my eardrums and made me want to rub out the sensation. Ask them anyway. Their entangled web may unravel if you voice it out. I paused for a moment, thinking of the first question to ask. One that was more important than the others. Why is this happening now? Why not speak to me when I was five? You were not ready then. He replied swiftly. I frowned at his white-tipped tail, the answer sprouting more questions. Ready for what? My fox stopped, the desert silent around us. I took a tertiary glance of our surroundings. For all my years of exploring our high desert home, I never came across this place. We stood before a mountain bluff, a cave mouth opened wide before us. From this vantage point, 
the mountain's rusty pillars stabbed into the dark night. The pregnant moon swelled behind us, leaving us in a lazy glow. There was no vegetation on this face, or even within five feet of the mountain, aside from the small smattering of desert debris, which formed a crude chalky ring in front of the mouth of the cave. I squinted, trying to see into the depths of the cave opening, but it was darker than liquid onyx, my own shadow bright as a star in comparison. What is this place? I whispered my apprehension peeking over my shoulder. The place of our people. The statement was said so matter-of-fact, I didn't bother arguing. Technically, the four converging points of Utah, Arizona, and New Mexico were Diné land, but a silent part of me, though it minuscule, did not feel this place was part of our people. This place did not brim with wonder, but gargled, bloody malevolence. My feet shuffled silently back on their own accord. It didn't feel safe to be here. The fox rounded to face me. His left ear twitched once towards the cave, then back to me, a tawny wave like shooing a fly. A flicker in the cave mouth drew my eyes, but it was gone before I could question if it was real or a figment of my imagination. I have watched your descent through life, Kai. You are strong, cunning, of our people. I want to give you which was offered to me. My voice stuttered on its own accord. O offer me what? I, I don't know about this. I don't even know your name or if any of this is real. My voice held firm by the end, sounding much more confident than I felt. You may call me Kla. He stopped then, and I noticed I was just outside the full moon's ring of light. Kla was a blaze so hot in front of me, I was afraid I was going to be swallowed whole. His head fell to the side, the edge of his mouth cocking back like a loaded gun aimed directly at my soul. I have something for you, something close to my heart that I would like you to keep close to yours. With that, he scurried off into the cave, the mouth gulping him down greedily. In the absence of his presence, the desert crept into my bones, tightening around them in an unbreakable vice. Shivered, moving from foot to foot in a poor attempt to gain some warmth. He wasn't gone for long, but it was long enough for the feeling in the tip of my nose to disappear. In his mouth, he delicately held something bound tightly, as if not to be dragged through the sand floor. He placed it at my feet, bowing slightly, eyes averted. A gift for my ward. It was the first time he spoke possessively of me, the title evaporating the cold from my body, leaving me flushed and steaming. It was a foreign sensation one I was not willing to examine thoroughly. In that place, our place, I felt wanted for the first time in my existence. Bending slowly, my fingers wrapped cautiously around the gift. The fabric around it unfurled like wings to reveal a necklace fashioned with dainty turquoise stones, each sitting between a luminous stone I wasn't able to place. At the eye hung a piece of turquoise the size of a half dollar in the shape of a teardrop. A gossamer strand of silver wove around the stone, securing it tightly in place. I was breathless. Come, let us seal our bond under the face of the moon. Carl's soft voice drew me back into the circle, my mind hypnotized and consuming only him. I was his. I've spent many nights reflecting on the events that followed in the moon's shadow, and amongst all shadows after. Each reverie, a part of me cries out for my younger self to turn away at that moment. Head home regardless of how unwanted you feel. Head home to the only someone you'll ever know. 
It is the only part of me that is left of the person I was that night. Cull walked toward the edge of the cave opening to the lazy smattering of stones that lay forgotten in a ring. In one swift movement, he vaulted over the ring. As his hindquarters cleared the space, a fire erupted in the center of the ring, his fur the embers sparking the blaze. I gasped, ill-prepared for such a display. He sat calmly on the other side, a single-tooth grin gleaming in the firelight. Are you so surprised that there is magics in the world, Kai? Even after me? I laughed weakly. <laughs> I, I suppose I shouldn't be at this point. Good, because it is magic that I wish to share with you. His voice boomed then, filling the night with only his presence. As his words flooded around us, a seemingly undetectable noise rose under the pads of my feet. It was singular at first, slowly rising in cadence through the desert floor and into me. It climbed, its steady single beat transforming into two, overpowering my own beating heart. A small wind filtered into the circle, answering the call of its brother drum. With it came the rhythmic sound of a beaded rattle, its jangled transporting me to the only point in my life I felt safe, my infancy. Clow padded closer, coming to a stop at my left side, the ceremonial music keeping time with his voice. Let us show them you are more than even such potential. Let us show them who you really are. Shed everything you are here and now. Rise into the woman you must be with me. I knew what he was asking, yet I remained frozen by my chastity. Sensing my apprehension, he continued. I do not care for your flesh. I am not man or beast of this plane in wanton requisite of such things. I merely wish to be your guide through my world, to walk as parallels within this plane. Join me, Kai. Shed your worries. Dance with me here before the light of our people's moon. Dance and be filled with the power of the Diné. The power of his words filled me, my hands gliding over my clothes to shed the physical part of me. Exposed to all who dared to see, I felt as free as an eagle. The moon danced over my skin, igniting its rustic hues under its gentle caress. Place the necklace over your heart and let your spirit soar. Quell's voice floated softly to my ears an undertone to the all-encompassing drumming that came from nowhere and everywhere. I did as requested. As the heavy turquoise stone fell against me, it scorched my bare skin. I nearly cried out in shock, but held my tongue, unwilling to show Clow any weakness. As the clasp snapped shut, a wave crashed through my body, nearly capsizing me. However, my feet did not let me fall. They found their purpose, moving with the grace I didn't know possible. It felt as though I were dancing with the borrowed feet of my people, our people. We danced together for hours. It could have even been days within the internal night, but I would not have noticed nor cared. We danced and my feet never tired, our continuous fire fueling us onward. We danced, sometimes me on two legs and sometimes on four, my mind slipping between reality and beyond. Unwilling to care of the consequences, I penned my soul into the desert sand. I woke slick with sweat, my brain in a fog, the events of the night only hazing swirls in my mind's eye. I sat up to take stock of where I was. I was inside the cave, my clothes piled crudely into a pillow. 
I was still naked, my source of heat coming from a pelt laid over my naked form. The fur wasn't coarse, but it was not as soft as Call's fur. As I ran my fingers over the fur, I recognized its markings, a coyote pelt. Gathering myself in the pelt, I called for my fox, but only my own voice answered back. A brisk walk to the front of the cave revealed the sun past high noon. Maybe three or four? Oh no, Tommy! In a flash, I hauled on my clothes, the material grating against my skin as if it were made of a Brillo pad. I cried in pain and frustration but proceeded on, my mind focused only on one thing, getting back to my brother. I knew my parents would be angry with my disappearance, a situation I could handle. However, in my absence, that left Tommy to shoulder alone with their wrath. I stared at the pelt for a moment, trying to decide to bring it or leave it here. A voice inside me told me to keep it safe, keep it hidden. I folded it quickly but carefully, tucking it into the dark of my cave and shot into the desert afternoon light. It was nightfall when I finally escaped the desert. For starters, I paid little attention to where Kald and I were going last night. An action I cursed myself for repeatedly as the sun ticked lower and lower behind the mountains. The lights inside the trailer glowed menacingly against the midnight sky. The Oldsmobile watched my entrance with disdain. Pop screamed obscenities to seemingly empty walls, but I knew different. Tommy wasn't one for fighting. My gentle brother, my kind brother. His hushed voice answered, only to have harsher words spat back. I had to get in there before it was too late. Bursting through the front door, I was prepared for the worst. Pop stood across from Tommy, his favorite belt in hand. The leather chapped with age and repeated wear stood poised at the ready. Tommy, to his credit, had wedged himself behind the dilapidated kitchen table, hands raised in a weak attempt to defend himself. His soft brown eyes met mine, relief crashing through them and knocking the words from my lips. Where the fuck have you been? Pop broke the silence, Tommy and I jumping in unison. I was frozen. All of Call's words and endorsements gone in the blink of an eye. I was a scared little girl again, helpless and afraid. The belt cracked against the counter, jarring me into replying. I was at Nani's house. You must have forgotten to come get me again. I tried to play it off, making him think he had forgotten again where he had left me. Tommy's head shook in a minuscule motion, my lie not good enough. Bullshit! Your shitty bike was just thrown down in the road when we got home. Should have ran the fucker over because clearly you don't need it. Now I'll ask you again. Where the fuck were you? Were you all spreading your legs for some tribe dick? He swayed towards me, the stink of his breath wafting to my nostrils, making me want to vomit. If you think who gets you into the good graces of the tribe and think again you're nothing but scarlet meat to them his words burned but not as hot as usual I knew that my people didn't feel that way about me Call showed me that the Navajo were the good people thus named the Dene the Dene were made from the fabric of the gods and it was time to remind him of that Fuck. You. I'm tired of your shit and your disdain for the tribe. For our people. You prey on their weaknesses and continue to pollute them with the very same thing that severed your own ties with them. You're pathetic. No wonder they cast you out. But don't think for one second they will not welcome Tommy and I with opened arms. I spat every syllable at him my words venom striking him back into the trailer. We stared at each other for a moment, my chest rising and falling rapidly. My father's mouth hung off its hinges. And then he laughed, 
a full belly laugh toppling him over at the waist. When he rose, his eyes were moist, his face red as a raspberry. <laughs> oh, girl, you have lost your damn mind. The ball's on you. <laughs> he laughed again, slapping his hip and shaking his head. Don't worry, I'm gonna whip it right back in place. The amusement vanished erased from every line on his wrinkled face to be replaced with pure malice. In two steps, he took aim, his wrist flicking his familiar weapon straight at my face. The sound of flesh on flesh was expected, but the placement was not. My hand sat poised right next to my cheek, his intended target, the rough leather biting into my hand and nothing else. I smiled. I said, we were done with your shit. I threw the belt at him, landing a hit to his chest. Tommy, we're leaving. My brother's eyebrows hit the ceiling, but his only response was a nod. Where I went, he would follow. He moved from the safety of the corner, but Pop had other plans. The whip sailed towards Tommy. Like I, hell you are taking my son. Get your ass back in that corner. It was faster. I didn't care or know how, but I made it before it reached him. At least he didn't have to bear the burden of my rebellion. The belt bit into my shoulder, but there was no pain behind it. Kai. Tommy breathed. How did you... Not now. We have to get out of here. I found a place. It's only temporary, but... We are getting out of here. Expecting the wrath of a thousand suns, but instead I faced silence. Pop stood, mouth open for the second time in one night. The belt lay forgotten on the floor. He began to quake violently as he tumbled backwards. <laughs> Working overtime to pedal away from me, I took the opening, not caring what he called me. I called myself free. I grabbed Tommy's hand one last time and ran out the trailer door with no intention of looking back. The cool air greeted us, filling me with crisp freedom. Kai. Tommy wheezed behind me. Yes, I mean it this time. We are never looking back. You and me forever, little brother. I looked at him, ready for his usual arguments of reason when I got this way. He was always the clear-headed one, while I was the dreamer. Instead, I was met with steel eyes. Okay, I'm ready. His affirmation lifting my heart to the stars. Call was going to love him just as much as I knew Tommy would love him in return. We were barely in the middle of the dirt driveway when a sickening sound swiveled my ear toward the front door of the trailer. The cocking of a double barrel break action shotgun trans transfigured my blood to ice. All I had time for was a swift shoulder shove to Tommy as the shot rang out, bullet hurtling towards our backs. I dropped like a stone, my chest slamming like a fallen tree into the dirt. My hands flew uselessly over my head, as if they were made of steel. The snap of the fetal position, a hair-splitting moment that cost me everything. I awkwardly scrambled to my feet, taking stock. Tommy was a step behind, dirt and pebbles littering the front of his shirt, his eyes wild with fear. We darted for the desert, just outside our trailer's home, hoping it would be our refuge. I wish I would have waited for Tommy to cross in front of me, to make sure I had his back as we ran for safety. I know now I had nothing to fear in that moment. Bullets didn't kill me. They hurt like hell, but they weren't fatal. The next slammed home, its owners taking aim. Its owner taking aim. I had a fleeting millisecond of hope as we neared the broken down mailbox that we'd make it out of range. Tommy screamed or cried or both in crescendo with a shot of the gun. Kai, no! And then...
wave of sand. The fall hurt, but my mind wasn't registering the pain. Something wet and slick coated the front of my shirt. I didn't dare look down, but the wafting of iron rolled my stomach. I heaved myself over onto my hands and knees and crawled to my little brother. Tommy's shirt was covered in blood. Tears flooded my eyes as I watched the light in his eyes join the stars in the sky. The sound that erupted from my throat wasn't human. It was the high, keeling howl of a pained beast. I howled as the last remaining droplets of my soul dripped from my eyes. The shifting of sand against boot was the only thing to distract me from my despair. Pop raised the sight of the shotgun you at my- filthy fucking demon! Look what you've done to my boy! I had, but I was faster than he expected. What have I done? I bellowed as I shot to my feet, claws jutting from my fingers, curving around the gun and ripping it from my father's hands. His eyes grew to saucers, his feet no longer capable of holding the beer gut that jetted out from underneath him. He tried to escape me, but there was no escaping my wrath. You have done nothing but beat us down and put us down, I seethed, and I am here to be the end of your tyranny. The words were not my own, but they flowed from my lips like lava. The air gorged with a mixture of sweet hot sulfur, a smell that would have rolled my stomach but now just smells like home. My pathetic father vomited, and when his eyes found mine again, he wept like the infant child he was. Pop whimpered. Please, Kai, however, come back to me. I'm sorry. For apologies. I smiled at him, my mouth unzipping at the seams, displaying rows upon rows of garish teeth. Too bad I'm not. My arm swung, connecting with his face like a lightning strike. He didn't move or scream, just sat there, eyes too wide, mouth in its final O, before his face split into four perfect bloody slivers of pie. Blood foamed from his pale lips, and I kicked him over in disgust, unwilling to look at him a minute longer once again except for the sheer coating of blood. Strange. I should feel something, but I don't. A small part of me screamed inside of me, but she was fading and would be nothing but a faint whisper. I felt bloated with power, drunk even. Such a shame it had to turn out this way. Kyle's voice tickled my ear, and I turned to face him. He sat next to Tommy, and I snarled in protective protest. Carl sniffed, his eyes glazing over me with boredom. I was hoping to get a... what's the phrase? A two-for-one special out of this? No matter. Come, Kai. It is time to leave this life behind. With that, Carl rose and padded swiftly into the arms of the night. I went to Tommy, his eyes glass marbles against translucent skin. My sweet little brother. Carl's voice called to me, although I no longer could see him. Life lost is a part of who you are now, Kai. In order to obtain the power you needed to leave your father, a life must be given. It is a shame two lives were paid to acquire your power. But that only means twice the power. You will be the most powerful skin walker of our time. I shivered, his words crawling down my spine. This was not what I wanted, but it is what I paid for.
This has been a Morbid Forest production. On our season finale, you've heard Desert Nights, written by Naomi Richards, with narration by Naomi Richards, Sean Moreau, Gail Von Katt, Luke of the Dead Man Talkings Forest of Fear YouTube channel, and Uncle Jared of the Ghosts of Hawaii Paranormal Paradise podcast. You can find links to both of these shows in the show notes, and I highly suggest you both run to Luke's show over on YouTube, as well as pop in Uncle Jared's sweet, sweet ghost stories of the amazing Hawaii Islands. Thank you so much, you guys, for participating in our season finale. I couldn't thank you guys enough. Our season two finale was heavily inspired by the Navajo, or rather the Diné people, and their stories about skinwalkers. And while I was inspired by this culture, there are some amazing indigenous horror writers out there that I would love you guys to check out. Authors like Stephen Graham Jones, Al Goingback, and Rebecca Roan Horse. And while we're an indie podcast, we also want to support other indie writers. So please go ahead and check out the links in our show notes for some of those amazing books by those really great authors. You guys won't be missing out. And speaking of indie artists, as I mentioned, we are an indie podcast and we want to support other indie writers. And with that said, if you're an indie horror writer who writes short stories and would like them produced on The Morbid Forest, please go ahead and drop us an email at themorbidforest at gmail.com to be considered for season three. We're looking for a few other stories to add in with Sean and I's writing. And on the back of that, we're always also looking for other voice actors. So if you're a voice actor out there that wants to dip their toe into our little world, also drop us an email. Follow us on Instagram and on Twitter to stay up to date on the latest and greatest with The Morbid Forest. Drop us a little love letter during our break at themorbidforest at gmail.com.